Good morning, church. So today, I'm going to be talking about Psalm 3. And before I get into any sort of a interpretation or analysis of it, I'd like to read it to you. So this is out of the New King James Version. It reads like this. A Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke. The Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and your blessing is upon your people. So, I've watched the cooking show Chopped quite a bit, and the thing I mostly love about Chopped is the language. I use terms like caramelize, aioli, and gastrique frequently. I still can't cook at all, and I'm not even sure what these words mean, but I use them whenever I'm in the kitchen because the words are fun, and they produce a certain, oh, shall we say, je ne sais quoi, which is another word that's fun, but I'm really not sure what it means. By the way, when I use these words, other people nod and smile, pretending that they know them, but I don't believe they really know them either. But one thing they do on Chopped is they take an ingredient and they prepare it two or perhaps even three different ways. So they might take a watermelon and they'll grill it or they'll make a salsa out of it and then they'll make a glaze out of it as well. So today I want to look at Psalm 3 in three different ways. First I want to study this Psalm of David as a personal poem of complaint and maybe even light imprecation. Next, I want to see this psalm in the light of its impact on the kingdom of Israel and the Davidic lineage. And last, I want to view this psalm in terms of the ramifications for the kingdom of God that was to come through Jesus. So looking at first as a personal poem of David uh, complaining to God and really looking to God for answers uh, when he was dispossessed of his throne because his son Absalom had, for, had, had uh, usurped it and had driven him out of Jerusalem, uh, I, the first thing to remember is that Absalom was David's third and favorite son. Son, Absalom was the son to whom David had hoped to pass on the throne. He saw leadership in him, but he didn't deal with Absalom's treacherous nature until it was too late. He was always very indulgent of Absalom, even when Absalom did things like kill his brothers. 2 Samuel 15 describes the successful plot of Absalom to usurp the throne of his father David. Then on the advice of the traitor, Antithapel, Absalom makes this mutiny unforgivable by shaming his father publicly. Verse 22 reads, So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And all Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father. And this is actually a misread by Ahithophel of David's father's heart. Uh, even when Absalom went in with, uh, you know, and had relations with all of David's concubines and, and usurped the throne, David never hated Absalom. And he wept greatly when Absalom was killed by Joab, so much so that Joab said, the people are going to flee from you if you don't go out and celebrate with them the victory and your return to the throne. So I want to look at Psalm 3 now that we've kind of set the stage, and I want to take it stanza by stanza. So the first stanza, verses 1 and 2, reads, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are those who rise up against me. Many are those who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And so this, of course, references the, the thousands of people that followed Absalom and betrayed David and uh and, and I think the last line of this little stanza is so key because it says, there is no help for him in God, which means that these are the people of God speaking and they're saying God is 
has abandoned David. God is through with him. They recognize the same deity, but just as uh, and Hithophel missed David's father's heart for Absalom. The, the people of Israel are missing God's father's heart for David because he, would, he promised to never abandon him and to love him always and to think that, oh, there is no help for him in God is a complete misread of God himself. But the, the other thing to note about it is that it's betrayal. You know, these are people who are supposed to be on David's side. There are, these are people who are supposed to follow David and rather they find, we, we see them betraying David, saying there's no help for God, uh, for David with God. The second stanza, verses 3 and 4 reads, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. And so here David hearkens back to and recalls who God really is. And he says he's a shield. He is something that absorbs the, the arrows and rocks and spears of his adversary. And he's the one who hears him when he cries. And he, he responds. And uh, here David adopts a posture of trust in the midst of this betrayal and trouble. And of course, you know, it's heartbreak for David. It's heartbreak because his beloved son, whom he has uh, cared for, Absalom, his third and favorite son, it has betrayed him and has usurped the throne. The third stanza talks about how David uh, responds in terms of behavior now that he has established that God is indeed trustworthy. The third stanza reads, I lay down and slept, I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves round against me. David identifies the peace and fearlessness that characterizes himself as he trusts in God. In actuality, Absalom's, Absalom's army was 12,000 strong. And, you know, the, the Romans 8.31 says, If God is for me, who can be against me? And David literally has tens of thousands of people, uh, warriors, trying to kill him. And it says that in the midst of this, because of his trust in God, he can sleep sec securely and not be killed in his sleep, and in fact, awaken. And then the last stanza, finally, is a call for God to arise and to help. It reads, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and your blessing is upon your people. So David calls out for God's help and speaks of his trust in God to defend and vindicate him. Often in the Psalms, teeth were used figuratively as language for arrows, spears, and weapons. And so figurative, he is saying that God will break the teeth of his enemies, but literally that God would break the weapons that were formed against him. So the second way I want to look at it, after we see this personal poem of David crying out to God, and, and of course we can all relate to times when we've had enemies and we've been betrayed, by people who are supposed to be our friends, and people say of us, oh, you know, God must be done with him. I think many of us have experienced that, if not all of us. But I want to look at now the second aspect of this, and, and it goes a little more into the history of Absalom. So this is the perspective of Psalm 3 and Absalom's betrayal from the, the, the uh, viewpoint of Israel's national destiny that God had ordained for Israel. So God had promised to David that David's throne would be established forever. 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13 reads, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Absalom Muslim, Absalom's mother was a princess of Gezer. Her father was Ptolemy, the king of Gezer. Thus David's marriage to her involved more than simply a relationship, a relationship, but rather a political relationship and a political alliance, perhaps trying to bring peace between these two warring kingdoms. In actuality, from the time of Joshua's conquest of Canaan, Gezer had been a threat to Israel. The Gezerites lived in the land that was designated for Manasseh but Manasseh had never been able to dispossess them 
from the land. Whenever Absalom was disloyal to David, he fled to the land of Gezer and lived with his grandfather. And David continually accepted him back and indulged this dual alliance between Gezer and Israel. Thus, Absalom's coup of the throne of David was a direct challenge to God's promise to David that he would that he would his his son would rule over Israel once David had passed. And rather than have a distinct kingdom of Israel, Absalom's rule and Absalom's uh, presence on the throne would have brought about a merging of the two kingdoms of Israel and Gezer and brought to an end the line of David as a uniquely Jewish nation with a God-ordained destiny. And so not only was there a personal side to it, but there was a national side to uh, this betrayal of Absalom and usurpation of the throne. But finally, and even more relevant to us today, is the third perspective of, the, of Psalm 3 and this betrayal, which is uh, the perspective of the kingdom of God as embodied by Jesus. So Luke 1, 32 to 33, speaking of Jesus as an infant says, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. So the usurpation of Absalom was not simply a violation of his father David, was not simply a violation of God's promise to the nation of Israel to have uh, David's lineage continue, but it was a violation and an attempted coup of the very king of all creation who was going to come down and establish his kingdom here on earth, Jesus. So the usurpation of Absalom spoken and prayed about by David in Psalm 3 was actually one of Satan's attempts to cut off the Davidic line of Judah from which the promised Messiah would come. If Absalom's throne has stood, and incorporated Israel and Gezer into one nation, the lineage of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, could not have been. Thus, God is true to his promise to David to establish his throne, and he is true to his promise to all humanity to send a saving king whose kingdom will never end. So here are our takeaways for today. One, trust that God will defend us when we are misunderstood and betrayed. We need not fear our enemies will derail God's plan, purpose, and promise for our lives. Two, give yourself fully to God. Don't allow, any, don't allow any geyserites or enemies of God's will to have any territory in your heart, in your schedule, or in your behavior. Possess your own real estate fully and embrace your destiny fully. And three, Pray for your family and don't indulge the seemingly little compromises that are made to evil, to sin, and to the devil. These can grow into full rebellions leading ultimately to the demise of that person who allows that rebellion to grow. Good words from the Word of God today. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the Psalms and they're so relatable and we just uh, love how David speaks from his heart and touches our hearts. And Father, help us to uh, have that same kind of forthrightness with you where we can come to you and speak our heart, but always have that sense of trust and knowledge that you are good to us and you will stand by us and you will fulfill your promises. We love you, Father, and we thank you for your ways and your word. In your name, amen. Have a great day, church.